Hello, this is Josh. Uh, first off, I want to apologize. I'm a little sick. I've been battling a fever, fever and a cold for the past couple of days, so I'm sorry if I have to like sneeze or my um, voice kind of cuts out um, verbally. That <laughs> doesn't make any sense. Um, but I'm going to be talking about replicating human-like gameplay in a multi-agent environment through reinforcement learning. So for the outline of the talk, um, I'm just going to give a brief introduction to reinforcement learning. We have two lectures on it, so, and one of uh, one of the, our classmates already did a video, on, uh, a paper review on reinforcement learning, so I'm not going to spend, like, a lot of time on those details, but we're going to look at paper one, where it's a basic um, reinforcement learning implementation, but in a complicated environment, and we're going to look at summary of paper two, where they have a novel ar architecture to try to mimic human-like gameplay. So we're going to have four key terms in reinforcement learning. Um, one of the one of the videos I watched to try and learn reinforcement learning used the uh, the saying area fifty one, just to remember them. But there's agent, reward, environment, and action. So agent is what's going to be doing the physical thing, doing or not necessarily physical, the thing doing the task. So in a game, that would be in like Super Mario Bros. That'd be Mario in the real world. That could be a robot, but it's what can take actions. The reward is what we're going to treat as positive or negatives to um, for our loss functions, and we have to define those for when they apply into our loss functions. And that can be things such as score or um, or more like sparse rewards such as winning. Uh, then we have the environment, which is what the agent exists in. So in a game like Mario, that would be the level. In a robot, that could be the real world. And then we have the action, which is things that the agent can do. So we need to train an agent that can take actions in the environment to maximize reward. So the environment that these papers are talking about is Super Smash Brothers Melee, which is a 1v1 esport. It's fairly popular with 100 plus thousand viewers and still 100 plus uh, with private pools that still go over 100,000 US dollars. It was made in 2001 and still played um, competitively till today. It's probably more popular than it's ever been. Um, but some of the difficulties of an environment like this is there's uh, multiple agents, so it's not just you versus the environment, it's you the versus the environment with another agent in the environment you're fighting, and that it's a high uh, APM game with a lot of frame-perfect inputs um, that occur in competitive play. So how are we going to apply the four key terms to this? Well, agent are these characters on the screen, so on the left is Fox, and on the right is Yoshi, so these are agents or characters that can take actions. So the actions these characters can take are, um, they can move their analog stick, they can um, attack with an A button four different ways, attack with a B button five different ways, uh, four different ways, and they have smash, uh, what are like called smash attacks too. So, and they can jump. Um, to simplify things, they limited the cardinal inputs on the analog stick to 16 instead of like the hundreds, um, if not thousands that are possible on a normal analog stick. Um, reward, well, there's going to be negative rewards and positive rewards. So down here in the bottom, you notice these four icons. These are called stock icons. These are your lives. So your goal is to hit your opponent off. As you can't see it on the screen, but there's going to be blast zones. You can hit your opponent off to kill them. Um, so, so your goal is to take four of their stocks. So every time you take a stock, that should be a big reward. Every time you lose a stock, that should be a small negative reward. Uh, every time you, you give percent, that should be, um, I said small, it should be a large negative reward and a large reward. The per percents is basically how far you get knocked back. It's kind of like the damage you've taken. So take giving percent is good, should be a small reward. Taking percent is bad, it should be a, a small negative. Um, and the environment is going to be the level, and you're we're going to treat the opposing agent as part of the environment. Okay, so this first paper used two different, and compared two different um, learning methods, and their goal is to properly train an agent to outperform top players in the Super Smash Brothers melee environment. So for the first that we haven't really talked about is Actor Critic. Um, I didn't have a lot, of, I don't have a lot of time to super delve into the detail of Actor Critic, but we have the learning rate alpha. We have the uh, this function is called advantage. This is the critic. Um, it's going to um, try to take the expected rewards at the current uh, state in action, and it's going to learn these. So this is the critic. That's one of the things that needs to be learned. This H is an entropy factor. They're inputting, so they're kind of modifying the 
McCritic um, with a set entropy factor to try and up uh, from what I've read is actor critic models tend to find a like a bad not a bad but like a weak solution early on and get stuck on it so this entropy factor is to try and get them to not get stuck on it this other gradient of the log of the policy at state um, at the current state in action this is called this whole part is called the score function and this is the um, actor part and this is a fairly long derivation to how you get to this gradient. But basically, we can think of this is the part we're trying to maximize. This is the score. We're trying to maximize this. And it's like the predicted, um, it's basically like uh, the expected reward from taking this policy just all the time. And then so, uh, theta, that's the parameters. So we're going to change the parameters of the policy. And that delta theta is what direction we're going to change the parameters of the policy modified by our learning rate. So on the right is this other Q learning method where they're not really learning Q. It's not the Bellman equation, but it's called n-step SARSA. If you notice, this looks very similar to the equation uh, before the Bellman equation where you have a um, this the predicted state and action for your model, and you're going to subtract the rewards plus the known for your model. But the difference with the n-step is you're not looking just one step ahead. You're looking n steps ahead. So in this paper, they did 10 steps ahead, which is why we have these um, rewards that are being decayed because they're farther ahead. But we're going to look at 10 steps ahead to um, determine the loss. So just some details. The epsilon for the random act for, uh, action for exploration with the, the SARSA model is 0.02. Um, rewards two seconds in the future are worth half as much. Um, both the models are just 228 fully connected layers. Agents can only take actions every two frames instead of every frame. This was just to save computational um, time. Um, and then the states are not pixel images. In this case, they're just, the authors decide, let's just read features from game memory. So they read um, position, velocity, the current animation, the current frame of the animation, each character percent, and more. They didn't really specify all of the states they were reading, but it could probably be found in their code, um, which they posted on GitHub. And then there's rewards which we've already kind of talked about. So I'm not going to delve into it, but, but like large reward for taking a stock and you don't want to lose stocks. So you want to deal percent. You don't want to lose percent. So one interesting um, difficulty they ran into is you can only run this game at 2x speed on servers, whereas Atari games, you can run hundreds of times faster for training. So they had to um, find a solution to this because you can't train over 100 times slower. Um, I mean, you can, but it would just take forever. And so they decided to do parallel train agents in one learner. Um, so this is the idea that if we have a bunch of agents with a policy playing getting experiences, they're not going to all get the same experiences. So they're going to ex be exploring different states um, and taking different actions in those states. So what if we have a bunch of agents playing getting experiences after a couple of steps, they send all that information to the learner the learner calculates the loss and determines how to change the policy or the queue and the models, and then that gets sent back to the agents and they keep playing. So this is a pretty um, novel idea that has since been turned into, um, has been like built off of in other papers in more advanced ways. Um, I haven't mentioned these authors are from MIT, Google, and I think Stanford. Um, so it was first trained on an in-game AI and then a different cycle ran by training against itself. So the in-game AI is really bad, and it's not like the goal for what you're training. If you've ever played um, the older Smash games, you know the in-game AI is pretty bad. In the newer Smash games, the in-game AI isn't that bad. And then this different cycle ran by training against itself, that's taking like an older version of the an older um, policy agent, so like an older agent and training your current model against that older agent, and then you keep cycling um, so once you get a better model, you then make that the agent you're training against, etc. So kind of how, um, actually that's how, um, uh, AlphaGo learned is by playing against itself. So this is the results from fighting the in-game AI. I don't know why their, the plot, their plots, some of their plots were really low resolution. So I apologize for that. Um, the purple is the actor critic and the yellow is the Sarsa, the Q learning. And, um, uh, we can see that the Q learning found, um, the, uh, converged to the uh, solution far far earlier than the actor critic um but the methods actually found different strategies versus the in-game ai so the um actor critic played like kind of like how a human would play it would take in a, it would attack and counter attack kind of normally but the the q learning would just stand in the corner and take a hit from the ai and then let the ai kill itself off a second hit so it found a, a more interesting strategy you could say 
Um, so when they were training against itself, they found that the key learning had a very hard time. And this kind of intuitively makes sense because if you're learning the Q function, so your predicted rewards um, for the state of action, it's going to be hard when not your uh, when the environment itself is changing. The environment is not constant because you're changing the agent that's in that environment that you're fighting over and over again. So the Q function really struggles with that versus only learning the policy, which doesn't have um, it. One thing about actor critic learning is it doesn't really have the future states um, don't uh, matter as much as with the Q function. Um, so on this this table is the bot playing that they trained against itself, playing a bunch of top 100 players. So these are ranked players. And we can see that it could beat all of these ranked players. Um, and that only some weird, uh, unique strategies could beat the bot. One was like just crouching in the corner. And so these unique strategies, the bot probably did not, um, the agent probably did not find um, from playing itself. And one thing, they did some transfer learning where, okay, why don't we take a character and there's multiple characters you play in the game. Why don't we train it on as one character and then make it play another character and see how long it takes to train? Um, so these numbers are just the time and hours um, from scratch versus transfer learning. And this table on the bottom right, I honestly could not tell you what the red, green, and, and blue are on the left. I don't think the authors could tell you because this chart is really just showing like how um, gr more green. So like as we see, if it's Falcon of Falcon, it's just this bright green. It's how um, easy it was to do transfer learning. So we see like that Fox and Felka, who were considered clones of each other, had an easy time doing transfer learning, whereas Falcon, going to any other character, had a harder time doing transfer learning, which also intuitively makes sense because Falcon is considered a hard character, whereas a character, character who's considered uh, a little easier has a uh, good transfer learning. If you learn a speech, you can go play um, as other characters. But so we have a we have a an agent that we've trained through reinforcement learning that could be the top 100 players in this game, but it's not really fair. Um, it has superhuman reaction time, so it's not. It doesn't play like a human. If a human, if when a top when a top 100 player plays it, they get upset because it does not feel like a human. So, what if we just simply add delay um, to give it like human reaction times? Well, these charts are them adding delay in a bunch of different models. Um, so. Uh, the reward uh, decreasing is directly correlated with the amount of delay added. They didn't really um, explain in these charts uh, which delay, how much delay it is, but in the next graph um, is explained. But we can see that in every game but Mr. Pac-Man, increasing delay just makes the model perform worse. So what what happens in Smash Brothers? Well, this is the Smash Brothers uh, Melee one where they actually define delay as 50 milliseconds. We can see that again, adding... 50 milliseconds of delay each time just progressively makes the model worse and it doesn't get as um, as high of, it doesn't find a state with as high of a reward. I mean, that makes sense because it's taking an action and then that action is being delayed X number of frames and that X number of frames is a completely different state and it's going to have a hard time calculating reward from its actions and connecting the two. But what if we made it play more like a human so humans, when we're playing, um, when we're when we're doing things that are difficult and borderline and faster than the human reaction time, we predict. We make predictions about what's going to happen in the future, and then we act based upon those predictions. So we're not really acting. Like, we would never hit a baseball if you're trying to act right before the baseball comes out. You need to predict based off earlier information of where the baseball is going to be. So here they're using um, an RNN with a GRU, which we haven't talked about in class. Um, it's an LSTM with um, one less. It doesn't have like a memory, like a long-term, doesn't have the a memory unit, but it's still like an RNN with gates. Um, and then they have the policy. So on the left, we have an agent, you know, it takes an action, goes to the next state, decides what action to take. Then on the right, we have the state takes an action, but then we send this action to some state plus the delay. And then it takes an action. So our actions are being delayed to later states. Okay. But that's not going to entirely solve this problem because we're not making predictions. But what if we added in layers that could predict the next state that's going to happen based upon our actions? So we have a state. We set an action, predict, state, um, go through another GRU, predict, GRU, predict, GRU. Then we go to our policy and take an action. And then we have... Uh, then we go and use this action at that later state with the delay that we predicted. So here's a side view of the model. 
So we have our outputs from our hidden, our GRU hidden layers, our, our old connector to the GRUs. We have our outputs from the GRUs going to the policy. We have the state of the action being fed, and we feed the next state, the next um, action, which is also um, being, uh, we know this action that's going to happen because um, when we're running this model, so if we predict, um, if we're on frame five, and we're predicting what's going to happen. We have a delay of four. So we're going to have um, actually here. Yeah, no, I can say delay of four. So we have delay of four. So we're predicting on frame five, six, seven, eight. And we're taking an action on frame eight. Well, we know what action is going to happen on frame six, frame seven, and um, on frame six and frame seven because uh, we already predicted those actions. So we can just feed the action we've already predicted in these layers, which they didn't really show up very well. Um, one thing I did not like about this paper, the second paper as well, is they didn't really show the like the full predictive layers like architecture. They just kind of like wrote it out, which I guess is fine. But they have this forget network, which is kind of to like balance the difference, like to normalize the difference between the two states. So you don't just jump to the next state really far away. You know, your your prior state should be related to the next state. That occurs, so it's kind of to help force that. And then we have our current state being modified by a delta state to kind of like slightly modify the current state. And then we have the new uh, uh, neural network that predicts the new state. These these networks are all residual style architecture with a feed for, um, and all the output shapes are equal to the state itself. And that and they're telling us addition of multiplication and component wise, so we could build a net the network based on the description. I just wish they had a visual <laughs> example. So again, this is for those P layers. The GRU layers are just normal GRU, and then the output is we're going to assume is the action is going to be fed um, into our policy, and we're going to take an action. Okay, so there's still some unique facets of training this. So actions taken at a state don't have rewards until the state after the delay when the action is taken. So that's quite a mouthful, but if I take an action, when I'm taking, when I'm at state one and I'm predicting an action, the action I'm predicting is actually going to be at four state five. Um, for example, if it was delay of four, but you can modify how much delay. So my rewards for that action shouldn't be calculated until I take that action on state five. So my reactions are going to be delayed. My actions are delayed, so the rewards have to be but at that current state are delayed until it makes sense when that action is happening at that state. So predicted states are compared to the actual states that occur when training, because when you're predicting states and you're training, eventually you reach those states and you can actually uh, just try to like make sure your predicted states match the real states that occur. And so the critic also uses the true state and not um, the policy predicted state due to this, since we have the ground truth. So here's the, the agents with different delay. Um, so seven, so mind you, the, the agents take actions every two frames. So a normal human is 15 frames, around 15 frames of reaction time at a 60 um, frames per second game. Um, so this delay six and delay seven are really um, 12 frames and 14 frames. So we can see that if you have delay with no prediction, you can't beat the in-game AI. This table is for the in-game AI. But if we add prediction steps, we can beat the in-game AI. Um, this is off training versus the in-game AI, so it's not doing very well because it's training versus the in-game AI. This graph on the right is we have uh, a delay four. These are old delay four models. So we have one that predicts four, one that predicts two, and one that predicts doesn't predict at all. We can see that predicting two still isn't even that good. Um, we really need to be, if we're delaying four, we really need to be predicting four. And the, uh, the authors found this is pretty consistent that you want to be predicting near what your delay is. Um, for it to work. So like the, here with predicting six and delay, um, the, uh, if you had like delay six, I mean delay seven, you're predicting six, it's fairly close, but you're still going to do worse than if your prediction matches your delay. This also makes sense um, you, that you should be predicting as many times in the future as you are delaying your action. Otherwise your actions and your, your the current state aren't going to line up. Um, so they did not, um, so then they trained this model. They trained a seven, seven model. So what they mean by that is seven delay, seven prediction steps. So they trained the seven seven model, um, and it did not beat pros this time. Um, but it did take two to three stocks. They only played it versus one pro this time, and it did take two to three stocks a game. Um, when being after being trained against itself in a multi agent kind of way, um, so it's doing worse than the model that can play like way faster than a than a real human. But this is the in the right step for creating um, 
AI and games that play like human like players instead of playing like superhuman players. So some of their future intended work is um so right now the agent is treated as part of the environment. So if we're a skilled human playing any sort of 1v1 game like chess, we're going to be predicting what our we're going to be learning from our opponent's happen, ha habits and trying to predict states not just based off our own actions in the current state but also what we think the opponent will take for actions. So is there any way we could have like a, the the agent learn and incorporate the opponent's actions into like predicting future actions. So this is a kind of interesting problem. The other thing is um, something that was kind of surprising to me is the RL, but also makes sense intuitively, is the RL agents had to over-input actions, because you usually don't put take no action as one of the possible actions for the neural network to do. As so they tend to over-input actions when compared to top-level humans. For example, in StarCraft 2, which is a real-time strategy game where you're using mouse and keyboard, the average human player is doing like 500, 800 actions uh, per minute, but the like really well-trained uh, reinforcement learning AI is doing 1,800 actions per minute, but they're performing similarly. And so, so if there's a way we could force uh, reinforcement learning agents to find solutions with fewer act actions with this help with learning efficiency. Um, and I also just want to point out that there's been like, um, there's like a deep learning kind of like sub community within Super Smash Brothers Melee. So here's some of the GitHub, specifically the second GitHub. The first GitHub is for this these two papers. The second GitHub is like a more modern version, but you can like emulate this game on your computer and play it online. So people will actually will host um, AIs they've trained online and let viewers, um, well, you can see it on Twitch or on different um, platforms and let viewers connect and try and play them. There's tutorials on how to create and train your own AI in this game. And they've gotten a lot better. Um, I've connected to and played one before. I play this game a lot. I'm number one in main, which is kind of like why I was interested in uh, looking into this game because I play this game competitively. But um, I've played some of these neural nets, and um, they just feel like a person. They just feel like a pretty good person. They're still not like um, top. Um, like they're just still not going to be like winning tournaments uh, skill level yet. Uh, but they've gotten like. Uh, Fair, they've gotten human-like feeling, and they feel like a good player, and it's like understandable the actions they're taking, which is kind of crazy that the, you can like train an AI to feel like a human-like player in such a complicated environment um, such as this. Um, thank you for listening.